Dr. Sullivan became the first layperson and the first woman to serve as president of the University of St. Thomas starting July 1st of last year. Sullivan came to St. Thomas, it has your age on here, but I'm not doing that. Um, <laughs> came to St. Thomas from the University of San Diego, where she was executive vice president and provost since 2005. She previously taught or was an administrator at the University of California, San Diego, University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, and the University of Oklahoma. Dr. Sullivan is internationally known as a scholar and educator in accounting and taxation. Her research and teaching have focused on issues related to accounting and financial reporting to shareholders and global tax planning, a really important thing in today's world, wouldn't you agree? She also serves on numerous public, private, and nonprofit boards. She's a native of Florida, and we are so grateful you're here and are enjoying our first, your first Minnesota winter, which was the worst in my lifetime. Uh, <laughs> she has three degrees from the University of Florida, including her PhD in business administration. She and her husband, Robert, have four children and three grandchildren. He is a founding dean of the Arati School of Management at the University of California in San Diego. So please welcome Dr. Sullivan. Thank you, Patty. And um, I'm going to give my age away anyway, because uh, I'm going to share with you my connection to Rotary. In 1975, when I started college, I was given a $500 per year scholarship from the local Rotary Club in North Florida, where I was graduating from high school. And in 1975, $500 was a significant uh, contribution uh, to my college education. So that's how I became acquainted with Rotary. They invited me when I was a senior in high school to come have lunch with the group to receive the scholarship. And uh, at that time, there were 50 men in the room and one senior in high school, and that was I. <laughs> so, uh, but I also was involved with uh, Rotary International when I was at University of San Diego. Uh, they have a Croc School of Peace Studies, and uh, we worked with them in terms of peace scholars. And uh, so I am familiar with this wonderful organization and honored to have the opportunity to speak to you today. Um, what I would like to share with you, and I'll try to do it uh, fairly briefly, is speak about the changing world our college graduates are entering and aspects of higher education that I believe can best prepare them for that changing world and how we're trying to deliver those aspects at St. Thomas. Uh, before I get started, I'm curious uh, how many in the audience actually are alums of St. Thomas? Okay, keep your hands up. How many have had children, grandchildren, nieces, nephews, sisters, other family members, fathers, brothers at St. Thomas? Okay. How many of you have family that work at St. Thomas? Okay, so I would say we're getting close to 50%, if not 60% of the room has some uh, connection to St. Thomas through your own study, your family study, or your, uh, your family's uh, work. And we're very grateful for that. St. Thomas has a very long and excellent tradition in this area and one that uh, we look forward to building upon. So I want to start with saying a little bit about St. Thomas, then how I see the world changing, and then how I hope that we are uh, using our um, assets to prepare young people for that world. As you know, in Minnesota, we have our, our public university system. We have the fabulous University of Minnesota, fabulous Minnesota State University systems. We also have a private college group. There are 17 private colleges and universities in Minnesota. St. Thomas is one of those 17. Uh, we have 10,300 students. So we are significantly larger than the other 17 private universities in the state. There are two universities in the state that have just over 5,000 students, and most of the rest of the private universities in the states would be 2,000, 3,000, or, or smaller. Um, St. Thomas is a comprehensive liberal arts Catholic university, and all three of those adjectives are very important for us. By comprehensive, we have seven colleges and schools. We have an array of majors, uh, which I'll talk about. We have, of course, law, business, engineering, divinity, social work, 
our College of Arts and Sciences and more, education. Uh, we also have a very strong liberal arts foundation and educational philosophy for all of our students that centers around personalized education. Uh, and we are a Catholic university. And each piece of that, I think, is important in helping us be at the forefront of preparing the next generation of young people to uh, work and live productively in Minnesota. We have 98,000 living alumni, and about two-thirds live in Minnesota. And it's actually these very elements that attracted me to St. Thomas. Uh, like Terry, I came from California. I'm very happy that every winter henceforth will be much better than this one. Uh, but it really was the people who are engaged with the university and their commitment and passion for the university. And it is what I think the elements we have to continue to prepare people. So what do I think is going to be this future world that we're trying to prepare young people for meaningful lives in? Well, I think we are just on the edge, really, of seeing how dramatically technology is going to change our world. You know, technology is not new. Businesses have had computers for 30 years. The PC is, is uh, excuse me, business has been using computers for 50 years. The PC is 30 years, and the internet is 20 years old. So technology is not new, but its power, its speed, its cheaper cost, its ubiquitous is new. But ubiquitousness is new. I was recently reading a book by um, two people at MIT who run the MIT Center for Digital Business. And they posit that we are, as a society, about to enter what they call the second machine age. They refer to the Industrial Revolution as the first machine age. And they posit that computer technology and digitization is going to do for mental power today just what the Industrial Revolution did for muscle power several hundred years ago. And that it will have that same transformative impact on our lives. What does that mean? How do we see Art, that we're on the cusp of this? Well, for one thing, in the next 24 months, we will, our computer power will increase more. We will add more computer power on this planet than we have in all of our previous history because computers are just getting that much faster, that much cheaper, that much more pervasive. So how will that change? Well, we're seeing it. One, in the second mach machine age, Everything is digitized, everything. From our photos we saw up here, to our documents, to our news, to our music, to our videos, to our maps, to our social networks, everything is digitized. And if everything is digitized, that means it is at your fingertips on demand through whatever your digital device is. On demand, music, news, photos, whatever. Everything is digitized. Everything is connected. We, we now have powerful processors, sensors, and transmitters in things. And these processors, transmitters, and sensors are communicating to the internet. You've, you hear the popular commercials about the internet of things now. So these, these transmitters and sensors are in all types of things televisions, thermostats, alarms, cars. And if you saw the, the uh, front page of the, I think it was the business section of the Star Tribune, there was a piano that now is digitized. And it has sensors and processors, and it can record exactly what is being played and actually send it to the cloud where it can then be accessed by someone else. So things and people are connected. It's just amazing. And everybody has access. We have seven billion people on our planet today, and three quarters of them have some type of mobile phone or mobile device. And many of these people are in developing countries, because that's where a lot of our global population is. Many of these devices are not the smartphones that we might have or our children might have today. 
But the World Bank posits in the next two years, they will be because of the declining cost of these devices. So if you can imagine, in the next couple years, the whole world will be connected to each other and to things that are creating data and broadcasting this data. Well, this is going to be um, a world that's going to uh, experience quite a bit of economic disruption. There are going to be whole industries that disappear. There are going to be whole new industries that rise. And the way we do things may change dramatically. So if you're thinking about studying in college, and you're thinking about how am I going to prepare myself for this world that we really can't even predict how things are going to change. Where everything's digitized, everything is connected, and everybody has access. Well, how do I think we can survive? What, what types of skills are going to be important? First, you could be a creator of technological innovation. You could be one of those people that is uh, creating some of our uh, changes in technology, a computer scientist, an engineer, or web designer, or people who are using technology to create media. Okay, So you could be a creator of technological innovation. You also could be the person that is the indispensable complement to the plethora of data that now is being generated because of all of this technology. We have huge amounts of data because all of these things are transmitting data. Everything is digitized. Who's going to interpret all that data? Who's going to help us make better decisions with that data? So if you can be the complement to something that is becoming plentiful and cheap, that's also a way to survive and thrive in this new age. And these are people like data scientists, business analytics, financial anal analysts. Number two, you could be good at something that computers and robots don't do. And they're not likely to do anytime soon. One thing is, they, computers are not very good at coming up with new ideas and being innovative and creative. They're very good at taking existing knowledge to solving a very structured problem. But they're not going to be able to tell Patty what merchandise is going to sell in her store. You have to have that creative, that, that observation of watching people and anticipating trends. So you can, be, you can have these creative and innovative skills that computers don't have. Robots also are not very good at doing uh, tactical things that require a lot of sensory, uh, that require that you, you are using your hands to do something, but you have to, to do it well, you have to see and hear and smell and listen. So I doubt that we're going to have robots making our food, doing our hair, being our nurse or our dental hygienist. So you can do things that robots and computers can't do. Second thing. Third category, you can be an entrepreneur. You can be the person that's trying to create these new industries and businesses. The Kauffman Foundation has studied uh, US uh, Census Bureau data and looked at over time, where is new job creation in our country? And disproportionately, it is with our startup companies. Disproportionately, new job creation is coming from entrepreneurs. In fact, they looked at from 1977 to 2005, they separated all companies into startup companies and companies that have been in existence one year or longer. And they found in that 28 years, for all but seven years, the startup companies, on average, generated 3 million jobs a year, and the existing companies generated only 1 million new jobs a year. And in fact, when we have economic growth, historically, any time we've had periods of economic growth, about one-third of it is attributed to new companies. Most people are positing that entrepreneurs will be even more involved in creating the new industries and the new companies of the future. For one thing, it's much cheaper and easier to start a business today, and I'll get to a little bit more about that in a moment. So you can be a creator of technology, a complement to it. You can do things that technology can't do. You can be an entrepreneur in creating new industries. And fourthly, you're going to 
even more so than today, which we know today is very important. But we are going to have to be a society of values. Because the real promise of the second machine age is to unleash human ingenuity to create a better world, which we, we're all committed to, and certainly you are as Rotarians. But our success will not just depend on technological choices and our inventions. As we have fewer constraints, as we have access to so many things, and we have so many ways that we can, so many choices we can make that have influences on society, as we have fewer constraints, it will be inevitable that our values matter more and more and more. Will we advance the common good? Will we share our prosperity? Will we build vibrant relationships and communities? And will everyone have the opportunity to participate in this new world? So back to St. Thomas, what I would like to end with. Why do I think St. Thomas has, why do I think St. Thomas has the elements that are going to best prepare young people for this second machine age? I'll come back first to our liberal arts heart. You know, I've been visiting with alumni around the country, and I was actually at an alumni gathering in Texas back in January. And I had about 50 alumni in the room, and I had a gentleman that graduated in 1956, and I had a woman that graduated in 2013. And I asked the group, what is the most valuable thing about your St. Thomas education that has made the difference, and you believe will make the difference? And th they had the same answer. Both of them said, the 56 grad and the 2013 grad, it, I received an education that taught me how to think, and how to write. Thinking and communicating will continue to be critical skills, not only for the past, but also for the future. And I think that liberal arts foundation that a school like St. Thomas has and that personalized education and mentoring is very important to this. Second, we are a comprehensive university. As I said, we are at the moment the only comprehensive university in the state of Minnesota in terms of having the full gamut of degree programs. That gives us the opportunity to develop the new relevant fields of study, to continue to update our programs, to have majors in things like mechanical engineering and electrical engineering and computer science and software engineering and neuroscience and finance and accounting. We have, now, we have programs now in business and in engineering and data analytics to teach people how are you going to interpret and analyze all this data. We're also starting new programs in public health. We have an MBA in, um, in healthcare management. So we can hopefully stay at the forefront of these new and burgeoning fields and develop new majors that respond to the new industries and jobs. Thirdly, our professors are committed to experiential learning, to teaching in context, to bring real world problems into the classroom for students to grapple with. You only really learn how to do problem solving by doing it. You have to deal with unstructured data. You have to explore that data. You have to find patterns. You have to find solutions. You have to test your solutions. You have to fail. You have to go back and try again. And, you, and if you're practicing this in real world problems, this is how you develop that confidence to be curious, to be analytical. This is how you learn to collaborate. So for example, our engineering program, you can't graduate from our engineering school unless in the last year of study, you work in a team of five to six other students, and you actually spend the year solving a real world problem that a company here in Minnesota gives us, like a 3M or a Medtronic, and you then present your results back to the company. And you've developed that confidence of really getting into unstructured situations and having to ask questions and learn as you go. We just received a grant from Excel Energy, a $2.1 million grant, actually to build a testing center for alternative sources of renewable energy. And companies who are, who are developing alternative sources of renewable energy, who are working in these fields, are going to bring their work to these testing centers for our faculty and students to help them test and learn how to make better. 
our chemistry students solve real world problems all the time. We have a professor there that contracts with industry to bring problems to our classroom. Do you know, have you seen the Coors uh, commercial where the bottle turns blue when the, uh, the pigment on the label turns blue when the bottle reaches a certain temperature? It's supposed to tell you your beer is now cold enough to drink. <laughs> well, the students in chemistry class at University of St. Thomas developed that pigment that would turn blue when it reached a certain color. And that probably was one of the, you know, it's not that they, you know, now can have a pigment that, that, that um, displays when the beer gets to a certain temperature, but it is students that grappled with trial and error and real world problems and had confidence to go out in the world and do the same. Fourthly, entrepreneurship. We have our Schultz School of Entrepreneurship. And increasingly, we, we have students who are starting companies while they're students at St. Thomas. What a great learning experience it is for them. We give them a network of entrepreneurs in, in, this, in the Twin Cities who will be their mentors and their support people. We have competitions for their ideas and their new venture plans. We even have seed funding and incubator space because we want to give them that experience of starting that first company while they're a student, so they have that confidence to go out and do it. You know, in today's world with 3D printing, where you can manufacture a product by printing it, with marketing through social media, with raising funds through crowdsourcing, a young person can start a company without a whole lot of money. The marginal cost of producing something and getting it out into the market is getting very low. That's going to create more and more and more innovation, and we want students that are comfortable being in the forefront. And lastly, values. As I said, values. Values will be increasingly important when you have unfettered access and you can make many choices that have impact on other people's lives and on society. And our mission has been and will continue to be to develop morally responsible leaders committed to advancing the common good. We hope to attract and cultivate people who care about others, who care about our world, who have empathy, who want to make a difference, and who care about the choices and the impact of their choices on society. And those are the people like you in this room. And that will never lose its importance. In fact, it will be continued to be even more important. So it does boil down to choices, boils down to the choices that we make and the choices that you make. And I'm convinced that the University of St. Thomas will continue to be a leader in providing an exceptional education and helping to make this a stronger community so that we can continue to fr thrive in this rapidly changing world and that the university can attract and develop that next generation of productive workers and engaged citizens for the state of Minnesota. So thank you very much, and I'd be delighted to answer your questions. Yes. I have a comment and a question. Um, as I was doing a lot of things with UST from the SBDC to Management Center and the school and everything. And what I noticed that I thought was extremely valuable was just the alumni networking and loyalty and support. Just phenomenal, I think, from St. Thomas. And then my question was, back in the day when I was spending a lot of time there in the 90s, the MBA program, I believe, was in the top five in the U.S. I think that was by number of students. I was just wondering, since MBAs have kind of had a dip and all that, where things stand with your MBA program. Well, thank you. Uh, first of all, I thank you for noting the power of our alumni network, and that has been something that I have been uh, enormously impressed with since coming here. Uh, I have not been in a school where the alumni uh, continue to have such passion and loyalty for the school, but for each other, and really willing to help and support one another throughout their lifetimes. Uh, our MBA program was very large in the 1990s. We had a very, very large part-time program. Uh, more and more MBA programs have been going to full-time and, uh, and some evening programs, but more 
uh, more full time than it had been at the pa in the past. Uh, so we have a full time MBA. We do have uh, an evening MBA as well, and uh, we continue to you know seek to grow that program. Uh, there are a lot more MBA programs in the market today, and as you rightly noted, as we've gone through this downturn in the economy, there also have been fewer and fewer people uh, willing to take time from work to pursue that MBA, or if they're working, being able to study and work when their main concern is to keep that job <laughs> that they have. Uh, so um, there has been a downturn in the number of people seeking MBAs, but it's starting to come back, and it never dipped as far as like we've seen in terms of downturns of um, uh, legal education. Uh, but I think what you're going to see more and more in the business education market, particularly in the graduate market, is perhaps more custom programs, programs that are aimed like our healthcare MBA program that are either aimed at certain industries or even programs that are aimed uh, at certain employers or um, and, and really custom to their needs. I think you're going to see that more and more. Yes, sir. Why do you think they chose to move away from having a priest be a president of the college? Well, I don't think they chose to move away from that because they had, when they uh, did the search for the president, they had candidates who were priests and candidates who were not priests. So I think they made a choice to choose the person they thought could be the best next leader of the college, but they'd never made a conscious choice not to have a priest. More questions? Yes. What we learned in Germany last week is there's a lot of collaboration <coughs> between the universities and the companies, and we'd really like to see that really enjoyed your comments about that. I'd like to see more of that in the United States. I could not agree with you more. The, the comment was about more collaboration between universities and companies. And I think the only way we can continue to provide that rich education that is needed is through that collaboration and bringing those real world issues of those companies into our classroom and our students out to those companies. I'm a big fan of internships. Uh, students have got to get out there and get their hands dirty. And I think Germany's done a great job of, of facilitating that uh, free flow between industry and, and universities. Can I take one more? Yes, I do. It's up to you. Do you have time to stay around after? Yes, I do. Yes. You can answer questions after that. Okay, so I'm sorry, but I'll be here afterwards. Be delighted to answer your questions. <laughs>